And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of Islis, a grimdark biopunk RPG. The one and only Veronica Ripley, also known as Nicotine. Save your, save your Marlboro jokes, we've heard them all. How are you doing today? <laughs> Hi, I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for, thank you for coming on. I hope, I hope you don't mind the beware of giants sign, because they are, because, well, giants roam, roam the temple. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'll have to, I'll keep my eyes open. <laughs> oh, just... If you end up sitting in in any of their spots, I take no responsibility for anybody getting squished. I'll I'll try really hard to <laughs> to avoid them. <laughs> so, if you if you at any point had had el had elder siblings or relatives, you should know that you should know that situation. No, <laughs> I'm not moving. This is my spot. Well, too while well, I'm sitting there, anyways. Too bad. They're gonna they're gonna hand me a controller and tell me that it's multiplayer, but it's not really plugged in. <laughs> Or handing you an empty an empty can of of something and say here you can have the rest of this. <laughs> I know all these because I'm gu because I'm guilty of all of them, multiple times. <laughs> uh, or or in one case messing with somebody's controller so that the uh, so that all the controls were flipped. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> or. Um, so, or hand, handing somebody their character sheet, but the whole thing's mirror written. Awesome. But it's tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Sure. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh, my first introduction to role play games, just in general? Yeah. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I was in high school and I had some friends who were running uh, an NWOD uh, campaign, a new, wor new World of Darkness mm -hmm. campaign, and uh, I, I just wanted to play tabletop game. I didn't care what type of tabletop game it was. I just wanted to play tabletop game, and I thought it was wonderful. Everybody was doing really into role play, and it was like a cool excuse to hang out with friends. But it was also like an, an opportunity to sort of peer into the creative minds of my friends, you know, who were in charge of like cr creating this camp. And we're all in high school, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, they're not, we're not professionals. They're just high school kids. And, and it was so much fun. Um, but I didn't role play again uh, with tabletop RPGs for another few years. I, um, I came back to it uh, as a Twitch streamer for my job. I, I am a content creator on, on Twitch mostly, but I have tons of social media too. Mm -hmm. uh, but on Twitch, I was uh, I was asked to be a part of um, of a show uh, using the Fate system, uh, and it was um, it was it was amazing. Like the the the, the level of quality and detail, and like uh, and just just the the cinematic nature of of role play in the, in such a such a professional capacity really helped helped me just fall in love with it all over again so since then i've done um i've done shows with uh with dark dark heresy i've done um star trek adventures D, &D obviously um pathfinder um and i just I, I really enjoy i just really enjoy the the cinematic side of uh of twitch streaming you know ttrpg shows that's why uh, my second channel, Fable Scraps, does a live play of Islis, Um and we try and do it like just the same way that I've that I've that I've learned to love it. You know, we have a uh, we have uh, really robust uh, like audio effects, and there's really cool like music, and there's um, really good like just sound effects in general. We we put a pretty high priority on uh, on entertainment value, so. I'm I'm very pleased with the way that our show has turned out, and it serves as a as a great way to like help teach people how to play Islis, which is uh just you know kind of the kind of the point of the whole thing, really. Which that end, it's funny you bring that up because that ends up addressing a bit of an issue that I've had personally with the with um the rise of actual plays and the and the like. 
is that with a lot with a lot of them they don't and I'm I'm not I'm not um singling anybody out with this. This is just a general thing. Um they don't do the best job at convert at converting watchers into potential players. Uh I see. It's it's what it's and I'm that's the reason I'm glad that that with sh with showing with showing how it's played in, in this case that is um, something that's being that's, that's being addressed in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like we we heard from people, right? Like we know as role players that it's difficult to pick up a new system, even if it's streamlined and 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 fast paced and and fun. You know, like we know how difficult it is, or even daunting sometimes. To uh, to 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 go all in on a new system, so that's why mm -hmm. for our show on Twitch, uh, we make it very clear that this is a system that that literally no one else has like as much proficiency with as we do. So, you know, when we go to make roles, we also explain how the system works because it's so new, and uh, and I think that's really helpful for people who uh, who just find Islis and really want to play it, but they're a little bit intimidated with starting a brand new system, and it and it is very important to to me that we have a new system because last year when wizards was going through all of their bad press over you know the ogl and mm -hmm. and all the stuff with D, &D and everything uh we, you know we, a bunch of my friends and i we all got together and we were like hey we need to find we need to create a system that's separate and different and not like that and that we can just uh that we can offer to people to say like hey here's a vibrant creative world full of of uh, intrigue and mystery and horror and fun and you can feel like the coolest human around in this system <laughs> so uh so try this one out instead and and yeah like we appreciate that it's that it's it's a daunting to pick up a new system but i feel like since we worked from the ground up to make it as easy as possible for people to switch over we've we've done a pretty good job of stream streamlining that problem away yeah, and it, cer it certainly helps that you're using that you're using d using just d sixes from what I've yeah, seen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, another another thing that we saw in just our our little bit of research is just that sometimes people who are not familiar with TTRPGs want to get into TTRPGs, but occasionally people are put off by the dice. And I've asked people this question lots of times, normies, right, who like aren't interested in TTRPGs whatsoever. Like, what's the biggest barrier for you for getting into a tabletop game like Dungeons and Dragons? A lot of people are like, I don't get the dice. I don't understand the dice. I don't get it. I don't want to get it. It's a lot. <laughs> so I think one of the ways that we wanted to help address that uh, is by using just a really normal dice. It's 3d6. The the system for Islis is a 3d6 system. So you just need three regular dice. Everybody's like, got d6s. Excited. Everybody has those, yeah. And so it's it's. I personally, I feel like it's a lot less daunting than uh, for some people than than getting you know a, a one d four and a and a d ten and a d twenty to play other games. Mm -hmm. um, then then again, even, it's fun. It's funny you bring up the die thing because I had I had my very spirited debates last week regarding. Um, games that use custom dice because I had said there's some there's something ironic of, about somebody ranting at me about how about how bad proprietary dice are and mm. he's playing fate mm, yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's don't throw stones in the glass house in, the, in that kind of um, situation because they, they were ranting about how much they hate the proprietary dice in um, Genesis and I, I was like okay you run you run fate which uses fudge <laughs> dice. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, when it comes to, when it comes to complex, um, I've so I've I've at on occasion brought out my copy of stuff like GURPS or the Hero System, if just to show how deep the rabbit hole can really go with complexity. <laughs> no, six hundred pages just to character creation. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> or, in the board game sense, I can always bring up the campaign for North Africa that where the where the board itself is larger than a small child. <sighs> Wild. Like it, the board is six feet long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> it's it's one of the it's one of the more infamous cases of that, and I've heard stories about about that game being played in like army bunkers and fights st fights breaking out. Um, oh, that's nuts. Th but um, and it is funny that it is funny that um, you're using a 3D6 since. GURPS does GURPS does a similar approach, and the re the reason they do it is largely because of the bell curve. Yeah, well, I just I also uh, I wanted to touch on touch on that too because it's not the, it's not just that we wanted to make ISLIS like a like a smooth process for people to to pick up. We also uh, wanted to reinforce the idea that within the lore of ISLIS, human beings are not the dominant species here. Uh, the dominant species are 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 essentially three different uh species that control the continent of islis they're the 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 monarchical fascist cassat hive mind uh species this this spider like massive uh creature uh they're the the highly religious and uh prone to to uh, to religious fervor the the tisk these mammalian uh, flying creatures that live in trees and and uh, and caves, and worship whatever they want. They're always bickering. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, they sort of like prey on the human need for 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 things like religion. Um, and then there are the 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 mysterious Lysertians, uh These this type of lizard like creature that uh, that we've kept very very much under wraps because. In the context of the show, they haven't seen Lysertians because they're not—they don't appear in this side of the continent where the show takes place. So we've mm -hmm. been keeping them kind of under wraps. Yeah. But uh, but what, what the, all of this is to say that humans in this world are not the dominant species, and that in order to succeed in Islis, uh, human beings will often have to work together to solve problems. And how we enforce that is through the dice mechanics because of that bell curve that you were mentioning how it's you're in a 3d6 system you're more likely to roll like in the center of the distribution meaning when you roll 3d6 you're more likely to hit like a 9 10 11 12 like around then than you are to hit extremes but alone those rolls m will generally not be quite enough to hit successes on most things and so islis reinforces the concept that in this world in order to survive humans have to work together so we have mechanics in place to help players uh, succeed at these roles more often, we call it synergy. Mm -hmm. And is is synergy a resource that's meant to be spent, or is it a um, in, is it an increasing floor? It is synergy is uh, applied in a couple different ways. Outside of combat, synergy is uh, when you when you're making a, 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 a just a, a straight check. Mm -hmm. uh, synergy can offer another player an, an extra dice to roll. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a 4d6 roll instead of a 3d6, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, or in combat, synergy can be applied when uh, when two characters receive the same initiate uh, initiative roll, and then they can affect their that can affect their 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 combat as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's we like to think of it as a really flexible kind of like a dynamic component to the game, and uh, I love the fact that narratively it helps reinforce that. That uh, that humans gotta stick together. <laughs> yeah, and speaking speaking of that, I do I did find it interesting that the core attributes, which you call vector, um, fits into a That's nice right. little a nice little acronym. Yeah, there, the there were two things I was guessing may have served an influence. One of them is a bit of a deep cut, and that is uh, Marvel Phase Rip. No, um, <laughs> like it, like I said, that's a deep, that's a deep cut, and the other would be Fallout with the special system, which also tangentially ties itself to GURPS. Yeah, that's right. Fallout started as a GURPS thing. Um, Fallout, we took a little bit of inspiration from Fallout, sure, but I think what we really wanted more than anything was. Uh, so like when we were designing the character creation element to this game, we thought that it would be fun from a player standpoint uh, to see that the that the character creation is really just a dossier that the Cassat or some species have been keeping on your characters. To reinforce that idea that human beings are not the dominant species. So when you design a character in this list, your character sheet 
it's your dossier. It's like the information that the powers that be know about you, that the kassad has been keeping tabs on you, and this is this is their report. And they see humans so lowly that they consider them like a vector, like a vector for malfeasance, a vector for disease, for uh, for moral ill repute. So uh, that was that was where we were coming from. It sort of tried. We tried to make it a little bit of a backronym, um, and I think we, I think we, I think we really stuck the landing on it. I'm very, very pleased. <laughs> um. Although, fun fact about GURPS, that is the only um, TTRPG that got that ever got raided by the Secret Service. Oh wow! <laughs> because because somebody thought the GURPS Cyberpunk book back in the day was a was a hacking manual. Oh, huh, neat. Um, as far as how you could end up thinking that, I have no I have no idea. But that's how it went. That's how it went down. Wild. <laughs> um, now one th one thing that I do f I do find interesting mm -hmm. is the economy of action that you ha that you have. Sure. Because you have full, major, minor, and um, free. That's right. And I'm guessing the I'm guessing the approach that you that you had in mind with do with doing this economy of action was to ma was to make it so that there that there's always there's always a set there's always a set of choices to have regardless of situation yeah i mean we wanted to give players the flexibility to uh not just to have those options in front of them but also uh the ability to enact synergy with their compatriots right so like some actions will be obviously some actions are going to be full actions and major actions and minor actions but uh but we wanted to give players enough choice to be able to say hey this turn the party really needs to deal some damage so i can take uh you know like a like a major action and try and do that um or i can use a you know a major action to assist somebody else mm -hmm. to with their role so, so we just wanted to give players as much flexibility as possible and i feel like that uh, was our implementation of, of of just making sure that our players have that that flexibility. Speaking of um, combat, there's mm -hmm. there are there are a couple of things that I ha that I couldn't help but observe. One of them is it looks it looks like you're not exactly doing grid combat from what from what I'm observing, but right. you are doing a zone based design that's a bit more. It's a bit more abstracted, but it's not full theater of the mind. Right, 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 right. Yeah, there, there is a zone-based combat in Islis. Uh, the reasoning behind that was we, we didn't want players to get bogged down with details because one of the, one of the uh, pain points for me as a role player is uh, the length of time <laughs> that combat takes uh, in larger parties. I mean, and we've all been at a table, right? That just takes forever to do combat. And so going into this project, what we all really wanted was to ensure that combat felt as like smooth <laughs> and as seamless as possible and as fast paced and kind of dangerous to really keep that action and level of, of, uh, of, of, of time is of the essence kind of mentality at its peak. And mm -hmm. so to that end, we decided that it would be a great idea to implement a, um, a zone based uh, idea of combat where you exist in combat within one of four different zones and you can traverse these zones via movement or you can um you know you can uh ex just uh, you, you can do certain attacks or, or actions within certain zones but not others mm -hmm. um you, you're vulnerable in certain zones and so forth so um i think personally that the option to go this route uh further democratizes this game to people who are maybe uh intimidated by <laughs> i know that this this might sound laughable to people especially uh to people like us right the, the who you know who that people might feel intimidated by stuff like like battle maps or by minis and stuff because that those things are such 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 uh, rich like features of the ttrpg world that some of us can't even fathom like doing a show without them but but there are a lot of people out there who like might not necessarily be interested in TTRPGs and the existence, the mere existence of minis and stuff might might put people off a little bit. So, uh, so I think personally that not only does zone-based combat 
further like speed up the, the the time it takes to do combat but also it keeps that level of adrenaline and, and sense of pace way way up and it removes that barrier for some people out there who might otherwise be put off by a ttrpg that needs uh like excessive like like measuring tape and and grids and stuff like that so um a, a lot of a lot of that grid stuff is very much an artifact of the war gaming scene from the 70s um and while i don't have i don't have any beef with it it's a case of there is no there is no one size fits all uh, yeah affair. yeah yeah Oh. Totally. And uh, and well, even even when it comes to cl even when it comes to clothing, I hate one size fits all because it because that is a lie. It is one size fits all if you're um if you're fi if you're five foot nothing or something. <laughs> but now since since both the Kickstarter and the qu and the Quick Plate um didn't have a didn't have a whole lot when it comes to character creation. That is one thing I would want to go into. Would it be fair of me to assume that character creation leans towards freeform instead of specific archetypes? Oh, uh, so let me talk about character creation for just one second, because uh, you're right. You're absolutely right. The quick play guide contains a few uh, pre-generated characters for mm -hmm. the for the campaign, the little encounter that's in the quick play guide. For those of you who aren't aware, Islas has a free quick play guide. It's available on the website. You can check it out at fablescraps.com. Uh, there's a there's a bunch of lore and some rules and some pre-generated characters and a little encounter that you can run at a table right now. Like you could play Islas at this very moment. Uh, and the way that we have character creation figured out uh, in the main book that we're that we're finishing writing um, is we have uh, within the quick play guide you'll be able to see that there are um, there are what we call orders which would be analogous to like a like a class in another game right like um like uh, a lot of us have heard of like bards or rogues right like that that would be yeah. considered a class in Islas those are called orders and we have several different orders we have a whole bunch of backgrounds and within character creation in Islas you can pick any background and assign it to any order and you you know you can you can use that for uh for the specific uh buffs that it might give you or flavor that it might give you for role play so character creation that way is uh is really flexible mm -hmm. and when you when you mentioned orders the f the first thing that came to mind is more of a um archetype like design yeah and what i'm the diff the way I differentiate classes and archetypes is a class will tend will tend to have a particular path more or less set out, um, whereas an archetype will have a will have a bunch of things that you're you're better at. But in yeah. terms of what in terms of what you're going to be getting as you advance, it isn't quite as set. That's true, and that's sort of how it works with Islas. Given that you can mix and match backgrounds, uh, it really does lend itself way to that way, right? Because as a, for instance, we have a, an order called the Expert, and the Expert is our sort of tinker, crafter, um, know-it-all type of character, Skill right? Skill, skillmonger, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but there are a lot of ways to be an expert. You could be an expert who specializes in in medicine. So you would take a background in uh, you know in like in, as a field medic. Like mm -hmm. maybe your background was that you were you know you served in some confrontation somewhere. Or yeah. you could be an expert who specializes in uh, in crafting. So you would take a different background. Things like that. Being able to 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 mix and match backgrounds sort of does lend itself to what you're describing as an archetype. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. And I'm guessing. I'm guessing there's there's a similar degree of variety when it comes to people who want to lean more into um, combatants, because you you've seen as much as I have how some how some games try try to treat the martial character in a one size fits all template. Oh yeah. <laughs> Whereas well, the good part about Islas is that the way that our uh, that our combat works. And the way that leveling and our characters work in in relation to that is that we have, uh, for instance, we have an order called the Scrapper, and the Scrapper is a like, kind of like a like the meathead type of character, right? But within the the world of Islas, um, bio augmentation is a, is a pretty commonplace thing because humans are so far down the 
the the food chain essentially this the, the social structure in Islis humans have had to adapt in a lot of ways in this world so it's we like to think of it as roughly analogous to a steampunk setting and there is steam technology but the 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 real meat of this is that uh, is that the ex, is the existence of these these bio augmentations these biomechanical uh, creations that you can attach into and around your body to make you uh, a little bit to make you a little bit less liable to lose in combat to be eaten to be you know to be meat so uh so our scrappers are uh our meatheads but they're also like uh they're also like bio augmented if they choose to be if they find some some uh some prosthetic augment that like you know screws into their bone plates and lets them uh wield some awful tentacle or some terrifying claw you know they can have mechanical legs or some super weird climbing harness apparatus like there's tons of these bio augments in the game in fact even in the show we have uh, one of our characters just got one so it's it's been really been really fun yeah, well, the way you describe that, the the two things that come to mind are th are things like solos in Cyberpunk and um, Street Sam's in in Shadowrun. Hmm. Yeah. You know, they're the ones who are usually who are usually um, kit kitted out to be as close as one can as one can be to the one man army. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, totally. And an important feature of Islas too is that any any uh, character can do any task. It's just a matter of how successful they'll be at that task. Because mm -hmm. within our character creator, there's uh, there's a list of s skills, mm -hmm. and depending on what order and background you take, you you earn a handful of what we call proficiencies, and you can check box. You can have a little check box next to a, a number of these skills. And those are the skills you get to roll with a full 3d6 with. And you can roll any of the skills, but if you're not proficient in them, you have to roll at a 2d6. Unless someone else is trained in that skill and wants to help you, uh, you'll be rolling at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's another way that we've tried to, to encourage players to work together and solve problems with this list. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, even players who, who aren't specifically trained in a certain thing can still do it. Like, there's nothing stopping your, you know, your wafy uh, scholar type character from wielding a heavy gun, but if they fail, the consequences could be dire. <laughs> and speaking of that, you have three, you have three weapon skills: um, heavy, light, and ranged. And I'm cur I'm curious where the dividing line between light and heavy would be for you. There's actually there's actually four. There's might as well. Might is like a like a hand to hand thing. Except most of the combat encounters within Islis. Uh, are stuff you're definitely not going to want to go hand to hand for. So, <laughs> so you real realistically, there's there's really three of them unless you're fighting another human. Um, the differentiation we see between light and heavy weapon was something that we talked about in design for the game, and I think really we've landed at can you wield it one handed is sort of the 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 kind of the impetus for like how we break that down right and like some th there's maybe there's an ability for a scrapper to say like hey this so, uh, some heavy weapons count as light weapons for you or, or vice versa right mm -hmm. so like um uh, so yes uh we do differentiate them but i think it's mostly down to uh to can you wield it one-handed and those things are all codified in like the weapon the like the weapon uh, tables that we have on the full guide, mm -hmm. uh, which is is where you could have the interesting conundrum of um of of say a bastard sword, or or yeah. an equivalent <laughs> because well, that's well keep in mind the other name for bastard sword is hand and a half. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, which you can technically wield that kind of thing one handed. Mm -hmm. uh, Depending on who you ask, they would probably dis they would probably discourage it. Um, I've one of one of my players has a kenjutsu background, and if you say if you tell him that somebody could wield a a katana one handed, he is going to get very annoyed, <laughs> and ar and argue no that's no that's a terrible idea. Don't fucking do that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I've al I've always been an advocate of. Look of looking at other approaches to um, how one equips the character because sword and board is boring. It is yeah. 
it is the it is the most milk toast ap- approach. It the, is definitely one of the one of the the most yeah widely used. If I I'd, I'd argue instead go with go with say um poke and board as I as I often call it. <laughs> and I I've I've or in, or in some cases just go just go with the with the crazier end of things. So if somebody if somebody wants to um wants to wants to bring around a bunch of spears and have an atlat to let them. <laughs> well, I've I give my players extremely overpowered but extremely dangerous to both ends uh, um weapons because when I was very young I saw the noisy cricket in Men in Black and that gave me ideas ever since. You know, <laughs> yeah, I love the noisy cricket. <laughs> or the or some of the very interesting weapons that were in the Alice games, like the demon dice, which sometimes they may may call in a demon to help you, other times it may call in another you may call in just another enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because the dice gods are a, are a true model of equality. It does <laughs> not ma- it does not matter your your gender, your ethnicity, your occupation, what have you, they hate you. <laughs> but they hate everyone equally. <laughs> now, one of the things that I, I did want to dive into is the bloodstream um, aspect. And I'm sure. guessing I'm guessing would that be a control for some of the augmentations that one could take since a lot of them are um, biological or biomechanical? Uh, as a matter of fact, yes. Uh, it's not the primary purpose for bloodstream, but uh, but there are augmentations that you can do to a to a human to filter out their bloodstream. Yes, there are also certain classes that are more attuned to substances that could help them uh, achieve a, a much higher high, <laughs> a much greater high, mm-hmm. without uh, without dying of stress. The way that our um, the way that our our uh, bloodstream system works is that when you ingest a substance, uh, we call them uh, we call them concoctions or vitriols or elixirs. When you when you when you ingest these substances, uh, they confer some sort of effect, whether it's positive or negative, depends on what you took. Um, but they contribute also to your total amount of substances in your bloodstream. And if that amount exceeds a certain threshold, your character gains stress or they pass out. Uh, or they die. <laughs> so certain characters, like the biologist, for instance, we have a uh, we have an order of the biologist, mm-hmm. which uh, which excels at substances. They're like the substance archetype. Like they they're 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 the kind of the closest thing we have almost to like a mage, right? Or some kind of spellcaster. Like they have uh, they have uh, an ability to invoke like status effects on enemies through these you know these vitriols that they can con- concoct and. And, uh, and expel through like uh, like 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 mists or sprays, but uh, but they can also ingest them. And you know their 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 kind of lore is that they they just spend so much time around these incredibly toxic things that their their body is just used to it. They've gotten a tolerance. <laughs> so a a mage by way of Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> we can't stop here. This is back country. <laughs> but. And the that I now given all of that, I'm guessing that when it comes to advancement, it is an XP as currency affair. It isn't strictly levels. Um, that's right. So we have we're our leveling system is still in flux because we are uh we're we're really nailing down the details of it through our gameplay on the show um and the way that our players on the show uh respond to it is kind of like how we're knowing exactly when uh when is a good time to like level a character Mm -hmm. um when characters receive a certain level they you know they get a certain number of of benefits whether it's uh, extra abilities or better like more skill points um the uh, the levels in uh, in Islis are not something that really um, that really contribute to a like a lethality of a character. They really just give your character more options. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like you're more, 
Like you're leaning more towards giving people more options, essentially leveling horizontally than strictly numbers go up. That's right. Yeah, we we don't want people focusing too hard on numbers as much as they as much as somebody would be excited to get more options for things. Mm -hmm. Also, we're also reinforcing this idea that humans aren't very strong on our own. Like we're not very powerful creatures. We have no claws. We have no teeth, really, to speak of. Uh, so instead, uh, the options available to your characters include things like crafting better armor, for instance. Like, you can craft armor in this game. Armor in Islis works by, uh, by a armor pieces type system, mm -hmm. where, uh, where you gain a certain number of armor pieces, and those collectively confer certain benefits to you. Like, if I have three armor pieces, I, you know, I, I have this much health, uh, this much bonus health, but also I, I suffer one movement or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there, the options available for when you for when you level uh, really just serve to give you more flexibility as a player rather than uh, number go up. <laughs> oh, and some something that I did no, I did notice is that. Well, f for one, given the whole thing of humans are squishy, mo um, the three pregens, none of them have health that's gonna go that's gonna go past twelve, and that and because of, because of that and the, and the way damage works, where it's using it's using the die that was used for the for the initial roll, um, mm -hmm. a couple a couple good hits could put someone in the dirt. That's right. Yeah. Well, they could cause someone to go unconscious. Certainly. Yeah. But. Not only that, but you have to you have to worry about um, how far you're pushing it when it comes to stress. And I get right. I get the feeling um, people fill out stress far more quickly than they would um, run out of health. It certainly depends on the abilities invoked, right? So, like as a player, some of your abilities will contribute to your own stress. Like it would be stressful for you to do a certain thing. You could do it. It would be stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, so, using certain powerful abilities might incur a stress point on your character. And at a certain level, you'll start to see debuffs to your character, and eventually, you'll see your character go unconscious when they have too much stress. Some characters and some abilities might allow your character to get more powerful by getting more stressed. Um, there's certain backgrounds that your character might take in the full game where, you know, you thrive on stress, so you want to have as much stress as possible without going unconscious, which which provides a whole new element to gameplay and as far as stress goes. Yeah. Um, but there are also characters who excel at lowering other characters' stress. So stress management is a is another facet of Islis in terms of uh, you know in terms of like like combat gameplay. Mm -hmm. Now, for my next question, I do I do have to ask one question that's kind of a setup. Are sure. you familiar with the concept of Appendix N? Uh, no. Uh, Appendix N was this section in the early days of D and D that contained a bunch of. Um, Rec recommended me recommended media to get the feel for what for what they were going for. Oh, um, okay. And it's it's used at, these days. Appendix then is used as a shorthand for answering what would be what would be in that particular thing for a given project, whether it be film, whether it be television, whether it be novels, whether it be comics, and so on. Um, yeah, sure. What sort of media would be in Islis's appendix and in that case? Ah, that's such a good question. Um, I I don't want to get too broad with this, so I'll give some concrete examples. Islis is a uh, it's there's it's not an overtly magical setting. There's no magic system uh, per se, so um, so it it rules out the magical elements of something like 40k Age of Sigmar, right? But that general vibe of like of like gross, grotesque, uh, you know, dirty, monstrous, uh, you know, h human subservience to larger creatures, like that, that element of like of uh, like Warhammer fantasy certainly could uh, could apply here. There's also um, counterpoint. A, a, another. Oh yeah. Necromunda. <laughs> yeah, Necromunda. <laughs> uh, the um, the. Design of some of our creatures is a little reminiscent of uh, of some some 
cosmic horror elements that you might find in a book like Annihilation. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. I have. It's a little bit of an in- yeah, a little bit of an inspiration for uh, some of our some of our creature design and some of our, our vibe. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, the 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 part that I'm drawing from from that specifically too is also the. Uh, the mistrust of other humans like you're all in this boat together but a lot of us humans have a real hard time trusting one another with something so valuable as our lives so uh a lot of the enemies you'll face in islis are going to be other humans trying to enact it to to enable their oppressors or to enact the status quo so you'll have to find ways to deal with them whether it's through combat or 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 what but that's like another little element of of annihilation that i kind of like that Mm -hmm. there's just you can't trust anybody (laughs) oh and I could, and if if I have to, for for what it's worth, if I have to use a um, Warhammer Fantasy e- equivalent, especially since you mentioned not trusting anybody. Well, how could I not talk about the Skaven in that case? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, absolutely. The biggest threat to a Skaven is another Skaven. Yeah, uh, yeah, there you go. If you, if humans were Skaven, <laughs> well, maybe maybe not that f- maybe not that far. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Skaven could probably could probably rule most of the old world if they didn't get in their own damn way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or then again, then again, um, you have you have reached a special level of hell when even the when even the Skaven are willing to work with other people to take you out. Um, yeah, looking, there you go. <laughs> looking at you, Skelly Pope, because <laughs> because such is the power of Nagash. Yeah, but. I could, I could certainly see and I could certainly see annihilation. I'd also I for as odd as this may sound, I could also see some of the um hell artwork that was done by Wayne Barlow. In terms in terms of just this bizarre this bizarre world that is very both unsettling and th- and threatening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's definitely an element of a, a very unsettling uh, in terms of the the continent of Islis. A lot of it is familiar, but a lot of it is uh, just 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 uncannily familiar, right? Like trees in Islis, for instance, they look sort of like trees here, but they're taller and thicker and denser and spiky and just awful to the touch. So uh, a, so so a German forest. <laughs> <laughs> our uh, our we have a background for a character called a tapper, and tappers are kind of like tappers here, where you got to tap into a tree to get you know on the sap or whatever. But in Islis, it's a much more dangerous and dire affair to uh, to extract anything from a tree because not only do you have to contend with the tree fighting back, but also there's all kinds of critters in the woods in Islis that don't take too kindly to humans around these parts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one one of the big taglines that you have for the game is how a thousand years ago they tried to, humans tried to invade the land and ended up failing. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh. That's right. It's been a thousand years, and now human beings have to have to survive in this world. Mm-hmm. But in truth, I I have I have joked about the about the German forest, but I don't think it's a coincidence that so many fairy tales across so many different cultures tie in, have the forest tie into their particular threat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Because I don't know... It's, I don't, a, I don't it's know, a threatening thing for a human. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever walked if you've ever um, walked in a forest at night with with, no, with nothing but moonlight as the as the main source of light, but it is a harrowing experience because you're... because... Um, every sound is going to be putting you on edge in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And there's no shortage of noise in in a forest. Right. <laughs> uh, which to that to that end, and maybe you've dipped into this in in some of the episodes, but do you suppose Eastleys could work as a hex crawl? Uh, do you mean to say like a like a dungeon crawl with like a hex based map? Some something like that. Hex, hex crawls are they're a bit they're not as prominent as they as they used to be, but you are having the party move across hexes and dealing with random events at each um interval. Oh. Yeah, I certainly think so. There's no there's no reason it couldn't, right? Mm-hmm. And then some sort of uh, macro view, like the players uh, meandering across a uh, you know, uh, 
uh, an environment like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that lends itself pretty well, actually. No. Another, another, just to, to, to touch on the the previous question too. I, uh, another one more influence of Islas that I I was really fond of uh, in coming up with this is um, there. There are two books. There's I Am Legend, um, and uh, there is um, another one of my favorite books uh, by um, Michelle Faber called Under the Skin. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with the book Under the Skin? I'm familiar with I Am Legend. Um, so especially, th- yeah, I, especially since it's yeah. gone through so many different names over the, over the last right. few decades. <laughs> um, Under the skin, I'm familiar with the name, but that's as far as it goes. There was a movie with uh, with Charles Johansson that didn't have anything to do with the book, but the book is all about uh, this uh, this alien creature uh, who comes to Earth uh, in disguise, has to disguise herself to look like a human. It's a little bit of a commentary on uh, on the, the the meat industry and our our standards of beauty and stuff because she has to undergo these incredibly painful surgeries to look analogous to a human and lure people to her weird little ranch where they you know she kidnaps humans and then like puts them in a in a you know feeding tank to like <laughs> like fatten them up so that they can eat them back home um the these types of stories were were instrumental in creating islas uh the the vibe the general feel of islas just that humans aren't the uh the dominant species anymore you know mm-hmm. that we have a different role here and uh and whether we try to rise above that role or succumb to it is uh is a matter of choice mm-hmm. anyway that's that yeah. i just wanted to touch on that really quickly that's yeah. i'm good <laughs> now given that you've leaned given that you've um dropped steampunk as far as far as, na- as far as naming things when it comes to the tech level of of things even if this is more biological Mm-hmm. Um, a big, th- a big thing with a lot of, pu- with a lot of blank punk approaches. Oh, right. No, I, yeah. no. <laughs> is, um, inv- is inventions and, and the like. So I'm curious how. I'm curious if in the full book you do have a full on item creation system. Uh, so to touch on the on the the punk. Uh, aesthetic of of the game i just uh, really quickly i want to say that um that when we apply the term biopunk to this game uh we do so in two ways right the first way obviously being that a lot of the technology is analogous to steampunk it's just biological in nature Mm -hmm. Uh, but also the second way being that this is literally a game where you are are functionally a human against the establishment it is the most punk of things (laughs) Your party is are are they're essentially enemies of the state, so uh, so I personally I feel like punk really really suits the world of Islas, and we came at it from that angle. That's mm-hmm. intentional. <laughs> yeah. But as far as item creation goes, uh, yes, we do. Uh, there's a really robust crafting system, uh, and we have a huge number of items to craft. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we do have a crafting system. Then I then I have a per- then there's a that's going to be a perfect excuse for me to introduce the noisy cricket in all in all but name <laughs> or so, or some or or some or some equivalent um i did i i um i do rec- i do recall it i do recall on more than one occasion inventing an item that i called the up button it is the short version of it is it is a trap that when you step on it you go up Oh, awesome. about, <laughs> at 40 miles an hour for about six seconds. Oh, that's great. Because apparent, apparently an easy way for me to get ideas for traps was to was to watch the golden age of Warner Brothers animation. <laughs> and, ju- and just all, all Acme. the... Acme. It's sponsored by Acme. <laughs> yeah. All, I had a... I had a... The last... One of the early, early runs with playing a spellcaster, I gave him a custom spell called Summon Anvil. <laughs> Which, awesome. if you've se- you've seen the anvil drop, so you know exactly what it does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially especially since event eventually I upgraded it to do anvil swarm, which is exactly what you think it is. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> just just the the magical equivalent of y'all are talking some mad shit for some really solid looking grid coordinates. <laughs> but given 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 all of the, given all of that since you mentioned 
one of the big reasons that I wanted to delve into um, character creation is that that because that's one of the, that's the most player facing aspect. It's one of the things that can be to new players a a bit a bit daunting when they don't know where to where to really start and um, pre gens can only do so much with that. So it's I'm get I'm guessing that one of the things you has tried to avoid was what what's commonly called analysis paralysis when mm -hmm. it comes to character creation. Yeah, we wanted to make character creation robust and flexible, but also uh not as daunting as other systems might make it out to be mm -hmm. right like we don't want you to have to spend uh forever worrying about like oh is this choice right for me uh and so we have a system in place where you make a couple of choices as far as the background and order that you want and the game will will further reduce your available pool of a potential analysis paralysis items down to a, to a really manageable set of things for you to choose from. So mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about looking through, you know, miles of pages of, of, uh, of options when, uh, when after you've made your first big decisions of like, who is my character? Where are they from? What do they do in this world? You know? Now, given that humans are supposed to be on the back foot in this setting, Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you maintain that when it comes to co when it comes to combat with things that aren't other humans? So uh, the way that combat uh, kind of works in Islis is that as a player, you are kind of uh, you're kind of I mean you're a human, right? So you're kind of squishy and you're kind of uh, you're kind of forced to make decisions that are more fight or flight in nature you know you'll always have the option to run from a fight maybe to a detriment but you'll live right um and there are a lot of creatures in islis out there who uh you know for whatever reason might really really want to eat that human flesh so uh so as a human being your uh, your abilities might expand later on in the game but your uh mortality will never fade <laughs> Mm -hmm. So uh, decisions as far as what fights to join and what fights to run from are still very impactful. Mm -hmm. A lot of combat encounters too uh, can take place among creatures that are that have intelligence and therefore can be swayed. There are uh, player character options available for in, uh, for be initiating like a almost like a like a social like wordplay style of combat. So that perhaps, rather than having to slaughter everyone, you can convince the guard to let you through. <laughs> and maybe convincing someone or distracting them is the best way than uh, rather than just outright trying to trying to do a murder. Yeah. And on the gear end of things in the pre in the pre gens, I saw that you had two forms of currency: that being Saints and Gents. And that's right. Uh, we have actually there's technically there's three there's mm -hmm. there's gents which are kind of like uh they're basically like the Islas equivalent of pennies right mm -hmm. and there are saints which are uh, more like a dollar right and then there's there's uh tau saints or blue saints and they're uh they're like a hundred dollars they're they're something that your characters would probably never see and if they do happen in the game they would be like a big moment like oh my god this is more money than my character has ever seen. It's so much money, in fact, that it's illegal to have. Uh, the way that money operates, the way that the that the currency system works in Islis is that it's illegal for humans to possess more than a certain amount of currency. So every currency, every every bit of, every saint and every gent and every tau saint has a hole in it that's constructed to look sort of like a metal plate, like a tiny little metal plate, like a, like a rectangular plate with a hole in one side. So um, your quote unquote, your wallet is like a string that you wear on the outside of your body where you can string these currencies and attach them to your outside of you so that um, so that checkpoints and guards can see at a glance like how much money you have. And certain characters will be better at concealing uh, stuff on their body and maybe they're concealing currency on them. Yeah, and I'm guessing that that kind of ends that kind of ends up addressing whether or not there was going to be some sort of rule of ten, or if certain currencies were only applicable in certain types of establishments, which could, cer so, could certainly be the case. 
That is actually the case. Right now in the show, the players are in a place called Arcadia Farms. And Arcadia Farms is a, is a, a place in the foothills of the Platelands, where the, the main region is, is called the Platelands. Uh, it's like a western kind of temperate swamp type of region. And um, the Arcadia Farms is a company town. It's, it's operated by several corporations running t together as like sort of a conglomerate. They operate Arcadia Farms as like a like a food preserve where humans are 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 used for like manual labor for orchards and 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 agriculture and they don't pay them in the normal currency they pay them in company script called a voucher uh, a shawl voucher so uh, upon entering the boundary of Arcadia Farms you have to talk to the guard and the guard strips you of your currency and says we'll keep this safe for you ha <laughs> ha and they, and then you earn company script while you're there uh, so yeah i mean some some characters um, do manage to hoard this like tissue paper consistency paper script uh, but mostly uh, mostly you're you're relegated to uh, to the same standard of living as the rest of the humans when you're in arcadia farms <laughs> mhm mm it's uh it's just an arcadia farms thing too that's uh the rest of the platelands uh operate with uh with with the normal currency of Jens jensen saints um is it a is it a rule of 10 between between jensen saints yeah it's 10 gents to a saint but it's 100 saints to a uh, tau saint mm -hmm. to a to a blue saint yeah the way you the way you described um blue saints i'm kind of reminded of the um japanese koku coin mm those 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 almost almost I guess egg shaped like like gold like gold coins which the standard was supposed to be that one of them was supposed to be able to serve feeds feed be um the equivalent of a year's worth of rice. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, um, totally. But the uh, just... the currency in Islis was developed by the Kasat, mm -hmm. right? And they're like these 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 arachnid type species, and they um, they're tall, they're huge, they're like mm -hmm. eight feet, nine feet, ten feet tall. They tower above a normal human, right? Mm -hmm. And the Kasat have so many eyes that um, that like geometric shapes and like fancy like filigree and stuff is just like enchanting to them. So when they developed the currency, they made a they made it look beautiful to the to the eyes of a Kasat. So it's like got all this filigree and like this uh, this like intricate geometric design on it. But it's really just they really just have currency to really to keep humans in line, right? They know that humans will do pretty much anything for currency. So it's a way to like to get humans to do what they want without them fighting back too much. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with that in mind, uh, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the book? Oh, it's impossible to say at this stage. Uh, we have yet to include things like, um, you know, like a, a big... Uh, uh, so there are some elements of the book that we're still working through as far as uh as far as dm concerns right so like we want there to be a sort of uh a sort of rival system some kind of nemesis that you can generate uh to follow the players and and be kind of their their uh their their gary to the players ash you know like we want there to be uh, an easy way for DMs to create like a like a like a like a rival to our players, um, and that scales and levels with them. So we're developing that as well. Uh, we have appendices. Obviously, we have yet to include those because we don't have a final page count yet. Mm -hmm. um, but we have tables and things. So it's at this stage, it's difficult to know what our page count is. But it's not going to be too much that it would be daunting, and it will be definitely robust enough to include a lot of the lore that we've been creating for the for the for the, the environment. Mm -hmm. It's, it's impossible, really, to build uh, an entire world with, like, a thousand years worth of lore and not have it be pretty robust, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, it will be manageable. Like, we'll have we'll make sure that it's not daunting and scary for players to get into and that the what we do include will just be fun. Yeah, and I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But awesome. with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to venture through time zone hell to come all the way up to my <laughs> temple. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to talk, whether it's to talk about Eastless or, or some of the more unfortunate um, choices of armies in, in, game, in um, Warhammer players, <laughs> um, Look, looking right at you, Chaos. 
<laughs> <laughs> the door the door is always open. As I often say Thank around you. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>